I hope you can see where the, the, the truth doesn't make her live, but it certainly makes her last hours easier for me to take. He did rape her one time. And he did handcuff her to the sink in the bathroom, but told her that he was doing that to give himself the time to get away. She thought he was leaving. She didn't know she was going to die. He shot her in the back of the head after she turned her head away from him, then went back and took his handcuffs off of her. Um, I met with this man. Uh, took Scott with me as, as support here. Um, I, I sat across the table from him and uh, before we went in I actually stopped outside the front door and told Scott, <laughs> well I guess this is where I put my money where my mouth is, isn't it? This, this is it. Either I can do this and forgive this man or I can't and I'll have to stop what I'm doing. And I sat across the table from him and he, he, he was a scary looking man, he was scary to me. His very piercing blue eyes, and he, and he looked at you like he was looking through you into your soul. Uh, he had tattoos all over him and, and uh, uh, big muscles in his arms. And he spoke very matter-of-factly about killing my daughter. Uh, no emotion. Uh, he said he was sorry, but you, you couldn't... You wouldn't have realized it if he hadn't said it. He, uh, he mumbled a lot about uh, voices and in his head and headaches and satanic advisors and weird things like that. And, and in fact, uh, he told me the reason he killed my daughter was because his advisors told him that, that uh, the headaches and the voices would go away with a human sacrifice. That's why he killed her. Um, I did manage to tell him that I that I I forgive him. I couldn't forgive the act, but I forgave him. And the reason for my visit with him was because, as a mother, I had to know the truth after what I'd been told, and he's the only person who knew it. He was the only one. And I asked him what her last words were, and he said the only thing she ever said to him was that, was please don't hurt me. Uh, and she never said anything else. Uh, he's, I asked him if she fought him, and he said no. And uh, I asked him if he hit her, and he said no. And. Uh, I told him that I wanted him to take a guilty plea so that they would not execute him. And he told me he didn't want to do that because life in a Texas prison was too hard. And he had, he had said that he was a satanic worshiper when he killed Nancy, but claims to be a born again Christian. So I told him that, you know, there's still good you can do with your life. If you're so concerned about the prison conditions, you could start a prison reform group for inmates. You could minister to men who need to find Christ in prison. You could still make something decent out of your life. And then I told him that if he was sorry, if he cared about what he'd done, he would not put me through another trial to please not do that. But he did. Um, just days before his trial started, he pleaded guilty by reason of insanity, or not guilty by reason of insanity. And uh, that, that pretty much <coughs> threw me for a loop. Um, no doubt in my mind he wasn't rational. I don't think he was legally insane, but I don't think he was rational. Um, at his trial, he, he rambled on for two days 
about uh, demons and voices in his head and and all kinds of really <coughs> off the wall stuff. Uh, Allison heard some of that and uh, <coughs> uh, just um, I don't even know why they let him do it. Uh, the the prosecutor didn't object, but they just let him ramble on for two days. At the end of his, and Andrea Yates, he was obsessed with the Andrea Yates case. He was he was most certain that that uh, that somehow they paralleled. I don't ask me. Um, he was found guilty. Uh, the judge sentenced him to two consecutive life sentences. On top of the two consecutive life sentences, he was already serving. He'll, he'll never see the light of day again, which is what I wanted. Um, when I took the stand to make a victim statement, I had a picture of my daughter and uh, that I'd been holding throughout the trial, and they had shown the jurors <coughs> autopsy pictures, pictures of Nancy at the death scene, uh, at the scene of the crime, horrible uh, images that, that I saw. Of course, I'd seen them before, so. But uh, uh, when, I when I took the stand, uh, I showed them the picture of her that I had smiling, her eyes sparkling, and asked them to remember her that way and not the way that they had seen her before. And I told Mr. Moreno that I hope God had mercy on his soul. And that's my story about what, what started me as an activist against the death penalty. What I'd like to tell you now is why I keep it up. It's hard. When I tell this story, I do it over and over and over and over again, and and it it it's hard every time. It hurts a little bit every time, but you know what? It has to be done. It has to be. It we have to make a difference. I spent the day with Bill and his family the day his brother was executed. And I could tell you right now, the person's family who's being executed, or the, the executed person's family, suffers the same pain, the same grief, they cry the same tears that I did. Because they're victims. They're victims. They're innocent victims. They didn't do anything. And you know, you love your child, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, no matter what. I looked at Bill's mother and I thought, how much worse this must be for her than it even was for me. Because my daughter died quickly, suddenly, without warning. But she had known for years that they were going to murder her son and could not protect him, could not stop him. How horrible would that be? How crazy would that make you? We're, that it's instinct to protect your child. It's just instinct. But if you can't, like she couldn't, like Bill couldn't. That's got to be a horrible pain to live with. Bill's family uh, was not allowed a contact visit with his brother, but the victim's family was allowed one with him. What's wrong with that? 